Our subject is Subject to Finance Contract 2020. It's the SER 310 form. This course is approved by South Carolina Real Estate Commission for four hours of elective credit. I am Mama Liz, the instructor, and the way this is going to work, we will go through the four hours uh, of the class, because it's a four hour class. At the end, there will be a quiz that you will need to take and you'll need to have a passing grade in order to get credit with LLR for this course. And before you take the quiz, you will need to complete a registration form. So you will need to contact Liz, L-I-Z, at agentownrealty.com. And the fee for this course is $25, which you will pay when you register. I highly suggest that you get a copy of the SCR 310 and have it with you during this course. There will also be an opportunity for you and I to talk during this course so you could ask questions. So as you go through, make notes of any questions you might have or think something you would want to discuss with me at that time. This is what you can expect. 165 minutes of video, 30 minutes of conference with the instructor, and a 45 minute quiz, which gives you a total of 240 minutes, which is the same as four hours. Now let's get into the contract. So here we go. At the very top of the front page of this contract, it says, and I've got it in yellow to highlight, parties are solely responsible for obtaining legal advice prior to signing this contract and during the transaction. Real estate licensees recommend obtaining legal counsel. Obviously, we feel like this is very important that you stress this with your buyers and sellers. Next on our contract are the lines where you put the buyer's name and the seller's name. If you have the buyers, please put their legal names, get the names correct, verify with the tax records to get the seller's names if you have the buyer. And if you have the seller and the contract comes with the wrong name for your seller, please correct it. The correction will need to be initialed and dated. For example, if you were writing an offer for me, my name is Liz Lotho, but my legal name is Elizabeth Lotho, and therefore you would use Elizabeth Lotho. Now let's get into the definitions. One thing's exciting about this contract, our old contracts had business days. Business days is gone, thank goodness. We all didn't like business days, so now we're back to calendar days. Let's look at the definitions. A, party, is defined as either buyer or seller. Parties, defined as both buyer and seller. It's pretty, pretty simple. Brokers are licensed South Carolina brokers in charge. They're associated real estate licensees and they're subagents. So all of the agents under broker in charge are considered brokers as far as this contract form is concerned. The closing attorney is a licensed South Carolina attorney selected by the buyer to coordinate the transaction and closing. The line is there so that you can insert the name of the attorney that your buyers want to use for the closing. If you do not have an attorney at the time of the offer is being written, you can put TBD to be determined in that spot, but it should have something in the spot. We continue on with the definitions. Effective date is the final date upon which a party to the negotiation places a final and required signatures and or initials and date on this contract and delivers notice to initially cause this primary contract to be binding on all parties. I just want to emphasize that effective date means that the contract has been signed, initialed everywhere every, by everybody and delivered to cause this primary contract to be binding on all parties. Good funds is the transfer of the requ required amount of United States dollars within any required time frame. And time, all time stated in this offer contract form shall be South Carolina local time. Time is of the essence with respect to all provisions of this contract, stipulating time, deadline, or performance periods. So any time in this contract will be time is of the essence. Hopefully you all know what that means, that when that time comes, it's done. There's no leeway. The next section deals with whether the buyer or the seller is a South Carolina real estate licensee. If they are, you have to check a box here. I'm going to tell you a little story about this before I go in more detail about it. The 
Real estate commission is emphasized that this has to be disclosed here on the front page. There was a complaint brought against an agent at the real estate commission because the, the agent had identified himself as a licensed agent, but in paragraph 28, they did not do it on the front of the contract. So the real estate commission found that they were at fault and fined them and did a public reprimand. None of us want that. So just follow the rules, put it on the front, not back in the back of the contract someplace. That will not work. The very top there says buyer or seller is a South Carolina real estate licensee. If the buyer or seller is a licensed real estate agent in South Carolina, they must check the box here. Just putting it in paragraph 28 of this contract uh, as an addendum is not sufficient according to LLR. They said it must be on the front page and all bold of the contract of sale. So you must put it here if the buyer or seller is a licensed agent. The next we go to two sections they're on the front page of this contract, meaning I think that they're very important. I put them in yellow to emphasize this. The first one, their initials go first. The buyer acknowledges receipt of the South Carolina Disclosure of Brokerage Relationships form and is receiving either client or customer service in this transaction. Check a box. It's either going to be client or customer service, one or the other. Check a box. Please remember that when your buyer or seller initials on these lines, they are acknowledging they have received the South Carolina Disclosure of Brokerage Relationships form. Hopefully you've already given that to them because they're saying they have it here. And they're also identifying what kind of agency service they want or non-agency. They don't want, they want to be a client or do they want to be a customer? One or the other. Please check a box. During this class, you're going to hear me talk a lot about check in a box. There are a lot of boxes on this contract form that need to be checked. Please check a box. Next, we're going to look at the paragraph on purchase price. Here, you're going to type in the dollar amount and also write out the words. Luckily, Zip Forms helps you with that. When you put the number in, it will typically write out the words. You definitely always, always want the words written out along with the numbers just in case there was a typo when you're typing a number. I've seen typos <laughs> that would make your head swim. One was supposed to be a hundred thousand and something, but instead they had written a million and something. Quite a difference. Be sure you always have the words written out to go along with the numbers. Next line says it is payable by transfer of good funds via here your opportunity to check boxes. It's either gonna be finance or a combination of finance or cash. One of the other. Check a box. Finance typically means 100% loan. That's about the only time. VA, sometimes USDA. Combination of finance is when somebody's putting a little down payment and using rest for mortgage. And then cash, of course, is all cash. This next line I see left completely blank a lot of times. I do review every contract that's written by the agents under my broker in charge license, and I see this a lot. It drives me crazy. It is in the contract for a reason. Verification of cash available for closing either is attached, not attached, or to be delivered before you put a certain time in there and date. It is one or the other. Check a box. And now we go down to the contract either is or is not contingent one or the other, upon the sale and closing of the buyer's real property, and the SCR 504 form either is attached or it's not attached, one or the other. Please check a box. And let me say right now that if you know the buyer needs to sell a property in order to buy, you need to check that it's contingent. Don't just tell the buyer, oh, don't worry, we'll make it contingent on financing, and if you don't sell your house, you can't get the financing. Guys, that's wrong. That's just plain wrong. Do not do that. If they have to sell a property, make this contract contingent upon the sale of that property using the SCR 504 form. Next, we'll move into the property and they describe what the property is. I'm going to read through this with you just to make sure that I know that you have read it at some point. The property, hereby acknowledging sufficient good contract consideration, 
that has mutual promises herein. Seller will sell and convey, and buyer will buy for the purchase price any and all lot or parcel of land, a pertinent interest, improvements, landscape, systems, and fixtures, if any, their own, and further described below, which is the property. The seller agrees to maintain an operable condition. I want to stress operable condition. They don't have to maintain it in excellent condition, new condition. It's operable condition. So the seller agrees to maintain an operable condition, the property and any personal property conveying, including landscaping, grounds, and any agreed upon repairs or replacements from the effective date through the closing, subject to normal operable wear and tear. Operable wear and tear. Buyer acknowledges opportunity to inquire about the owner's association issues, common area issues, condominium master deed issues, assigned parking storage areas, memberships, lease issues, and financial equipment prior to signing the contract. Leasing issues and items and finance equipment see adjusted. That is the tenants, leases, future vacation renters, South Carolina Vacation Rental Act reservations, rents, deposits, documents, solar panels, fuel tanks with fuel, alarm systems, satellite equipment, and roll carts. It specifically spells all these things out that are included as property. I highly recommend that you go over this paragraph in detail with your buyers before they sign the contract. This next section is important. Well, everything in the contract is really important. I shouldn't keep saying that because everything is. You just want to make sure that you have correct information when you start filling this out. We will go through it line by line there. This section is self-explanatory. You put in the address of the property, the zip code, lot block. If you do not know, maybe the property doesn't have a block number. Maybe it only has a lot number or it does not have a section and phase. You put NA in any spot on the contract that you do not have information for it. So in these, if it does not have a block in the legal description, then put NA. If there's no section or phase in the legal description, put NA. Do that on all the blanks that you do not have information for. Be extremely careful when you're typing in the tax map number. Double check it with the tax records to be sure you're correct. Be sure you do not have a typo in it. Very important. We move on down now to the next section. Parties agree that no personal property will transfer as part of the sale except described below and or in an attachment. Be careful what you put here. Um, even though lenders tell you not to put them in the contract, if they are to remain, you should include them. A lender does not like to see certain things. They do not mind seeing a refrigerator, washer, dryer. But when it comes to a boat, uh, those kind of things, uh, that are a lot of furniture, the lender does not want those in the contract because they are not given a mortgage on a boat or uh, furniture or any of those items. If there is a John boat or something like that that goes with the sale, you need to use a bill of sale for that. And by the way, guys, when you use a bill of sale, legally, you're supposed to put the true value of that item, not just a dollar, but the true value. Do not get caught with a loan officer telling you to just do it outside of closing. Never, ever, ever do that. Never. Also, you might want to think about if you put things that are in, currently in the MLS, uh, you assume that things that are currently in the MLS would go with the sale. That is not true. Do not assume that. If the buyer wants everything that's in the listed, listed property on the MLS, you need to include that in the contract of sale. Remember that a listing agreement is between the seller and the real estate company. It has nothing to do with the buyer. And the contract of sale is between the buyer and the seller. Nothing to do with the real estate company. If you remember those things, you'll always be good. Now, if they want everything that's in the MLS, you can always put in this section, everything that was enlisted in the MLS on March the 30th, 2020. Put a specific date, and then you would be safe. Also remember that if you are going to include things on a bill of sale, the bill of sale needs to be referenced in the contract of sale. Next, we're going to talk about conveyance, closing date. Closing occurs when the seller conveys property to buyer and occurs no later than 5 p.m., on or before 
you put a date in there and that becomes your closing date. If your buyer is getting a mortgage, you definitely want to put at least four weeks, at least four weeks, probably more like five or six just to be safe in that spot. Of course, if it's cash, it can be done in a couple of weeks. And the reason I say a couple of weeks is because most attorneys are backed up and it takes them that long to get the title search done and get prepared for the closing. Conveyance shall be fee simple, made subject to all easements, reservations, rights of way, restrictive covenants of record, provided they do not make the title unmarketable or adversely affect the use value of the property in a material way, and to all government statutes, ordinances, rules, permits, and regulations. Seller agrees to convey marketable title with a properly recorded general warranty deed, free of encumbrances and liens, except as herein stated and in the names, and you have a line where you put the names that the property will be deeded to. I see some people put in to be determined. I know attorneys really like to see the names in the contract. It's a huge help to them. And the ownership type is determined by the buyer. The different types of ownership are the sole ownership, if it's just one person, a joint tenancy, a joint tenancy with the rights of survivorship, tenants in common, a community problem. Those are the types, so the buyer will determine what type they want the deed in. Let's go back and talk about this title that the seller is going to give. Agreed to convey a marketable title with a properly recorded general warranty deed. There are different types of deeds out there. So you definitely, your buyer wants a general warranty deed. That is the best type of deed you can get. Some um, tax sales will come with limited warranty deeds, some back bank sales. Your buyer really wants the recorded general warranty deed. And this is saying conveying a marketable title. There's a separate video on title, but the title insurance. A marketable title is different from an insurable title. Sometimes companies will insure a title, but it really is not marketable. Then we go on to say the deed shall be delivered to the closing attorney's designated place on or before the closing date, no later than 10 a.m. We've got a time here, and there's a date above. A seller agrees to pay all statutory deed recording fees. And I've highlighted this because I hear agents all the time saying the contract doesn't say who pays the deed recording fees, but it does. It says it right here. Parties agree the broker shall have access to the closing and relevant documents. The broker shall be given copies of the settlement statement prior to closing for review. Parties agree to hire and use licensed attorneys. And it's best if you use a real estate attorney. Seller will convey possession of a vacant and reasonably clean property, free of debris, along with all keys, codes, remote controls, available documents, and similar ownership items to the buyer at closing. Let's talk a moment about this seller shall convey possession of a vacant and reasonably clean property. What does reasonably clean mean? It means one thing to me, another thing to you. It's very subjective. If your buyer wants a house really clean, professionally clean, you need to put it in the contract. You would write that in paragraph 28 of this contract. Just remember, it does not say they will leave it professionally cleaned. It says reasonably clean. Please notice that the automatic extension clause that used to be in our contracts before this one, this form, is no longer there. So you have a specific date with not an extension clause. I like this. Next, we're going to look at earnest money section. Earnest money. This, for some reason, the top of this is confusing to people. I don't really understand it, but it is. So we're going to talk about that. It says the total, which has a blank, total dollar amount, earnest money, is paid as follows. Blank accompanies this offer, and blank will be paid by 6 p.m. on a certain date. And then the earnest money is in the form of a check, cash, or other. Check a box. It's one of those. When we talk about the blanks, obviously if the earnest money is going to be $5,000, you put, you put $5,000 in the first blank. If it's going to accompany the contract, then you put $5,000 in the second blank that it's going to accompany this offer. And you put N.A. will be paid by 6 p.m. on a certain date. And you don't put a date. You put an N.A. in that spot as well. If the $5,000 is not going to go with the offer, then you put N.A. that it's not accompanying the offer. N.A. Or you can put zero, either one. And then the $5,000 will be paid by 6 p.m. on, and you put a date there. Then we go on that it's going to be a credit to the buyer at closing. 
are dispersed only as parties agree in writing or by court order or by contract or is required for closing by closing attorney. This is the first time we're talking about the earnest money will be dispersed only in certain ways. You have to have buyer and seller agree, a standard closing, or court order. Then buyer and seller authorize blank as escrow agent to deposit and hold and disperse earnest money according to the terms of any separate escrow agreement, the law, and in regulations. You want to be very careful what you put in this spot. Whatever name is on the front of the check that the buyer is writing needs to be in this spot. If it's an attorney's office, the attorney's name should go here. If it's a real estate company, the real estate name should go there. Going back for a second, whether the earnest money is going to be check, cash, or other, a lot of real estate companies do not accept cash, nor do attorneys accept cash. So be careful about that. It goes on to say the broker does not guarantee payment of a check or checks except it is earnest money. Parties direct the escrow agent to communi communicate reasonable information confirming receipt and status of earnest money upon a broker's request. This is important. This contract now does not have a place for anybody to sign saying they have the earnest money. You agents need to follow up with whomever is supposed to be holding that earnest money to be absolutely sure they have it, it's been deposited, and that it's good. And it goes on the last line. It says, if earnest money is not delivered by the agreed upon date above, the seller may terminate the contract by delivering notice of termination to the buyer. So if the earnest money is not delivered by that date, if they're supposed to deliver it by date, the seller may terminate the contract by delivering notice of termination to the buyer. Your buyer needs to be told emphatically up front that if they're going to pay the earnest money by a certain date and they do not pay it by that date, the seller has the authority to terminate the contract. They may have a contract backup contract for a higher price or whatever. The buyer needs to be aware of this. This next section of the contract is all in bold, all caps and bold. So it's supposed to be, let you know it's very, very important. Unfortunately, what a lot of people do is when they see something like this, they just skip over it. Parties understand and agree that under all circumstances, including default, the escrow agent will not disperse earnest money deposit to either party until both parties have executed an agreement authorizing the disbursement, that is using a SCR 518 or 517, a mediation agreement, those are the release of contract disbursement forms, or until a court of competent jurisdiction has directed a disbursement. Earnest money will not be dispersed until determined to be good funds. If legal actions occur related to earnest money, party receiving the least amount of earnest money in the court's disbursement order agrees to indemnify escrow agents' fees, court costs, and attorney fees. If interpleader is to be utilized, parties agree that blank shall be paid to the escrow agent by the parties as compensation before escrow agent initiates court of competence jurisdiction proceedings on earnest money. This blank, as far as agent on holding the earnest money, would just roughly be $100 because small claims court typically costs in the 90s. If attorneys or other real estate companies are holding the earnest money we don't know what they would put there be up to them you could put in a if agent own is not holding it and you don't know what to go there remember no blanks on the contract shall be left blank in essence what this black paragraph is saying is earnest money is not going to be re returned or done anything with dispersed at all until either there's an agreement signed by both parties or the court says who gets the earnest money Basic. That's basic and simple. Next, we're going to look at the transaction costs. Your contract form spells out specifically what the different costs are. It's all listed here for you. First, it lists the buyer's transaction costs. Buyer's transaction costs include all costs and closing costs resulting from selected financing, prepaid recurring items, insurance, including but not limited to mortgage insurance, title insurance, lender owner, flood insurance, and hazard insurance. Discount points, interest, non-recurring closing costs, title exam, FHA, VA allowable costs, fees and expenses of the buyer's attorney, contractually required real estate broker compensation, and the cost of any inspector, appraiser, or surveyor. Then it goes into the seller's transaction costs. They include deed preparation, deed recording costs, deed stamps, tax recording costs calculated based on the value of the property, 
all costs necessary to deliver marketable title and payoffs, satisfactions of mortgages and liens, record and recording, property taxes prorated at closing, contractually required real estate broker compensation, and fees and expenses of the seller's attorney. You must go over these with your buyer and or your seller, and if they don't like any part of this or want something not there, then you need to address that. Below is a section that addresses if the buyer wants the seller to pay any of their closing costs. It is addressed here in the contract. This next section is awesome. All costs to obtain information from or pertaining to owners associations, private public transfer fees, and any costs similar to transfer fees, that is certificate of assessment, capital contributions, working capital, estoppel fees, or otherwise named but similar fees. They either are the seller's or the buyer's transaction costs. You have a choice. It's either or, either or, seller or buyer. Check a box. If no box is checked, these costs will be added to the seller's transaction cost. So if no box is checked, they will be added to the seller's transaction cost. Be aware. Make sure your seller is aware of that. I view my contracts from the agents. This is another thing that is left unchecked so many times. It's there. You check a box. It's either or. Be careful because if you don't check a box and you have the seller, then it's going to be the seller's transaction cost. So watch out for that. And then I note here that the former contract we were using had a blank line and that is no longer there. We like that. Now we move to the closing cost section if the buyer wants the seller to pay any of the buyer's closing cost. At closing, the seller will pay buyer's cost not to exceed blank dollars. The percent that used to be there is no longer here. It's now it's simply dollars, which includes non-allowable costs first and then allowable costs with FHA and VA. Buyers responsible for any buyer's transaction cost exceeding this amount. If the amount exceeds the actual amount of these costs, those costs are amount allowed by the lender, any excess funds will revert to the seller. Make sure your buyer is aware of that. So if you're doing a loan, that you know is going to require about $6,000 in closing costs, but you put $7,000 in the spot, then the closing costs are only $6,000 that seller is going to get the extra thousand, not the buyer. Make sure your buyer is aware and that you try to be careful about the amount you put in that spot. Check with your lender to get a, a amount which should go in there. It also says here that the seller will provide or pay all of the seller's transaction costs. If there's no closing, the buyer is responsible for the buyer's transaction costs and the seller is responsible for the seller's transaction costs. Unless otherwise agreed in writing, buyer will pay buyer's transaction costs and seller will pay seller's transaction costs. Now let's get to the finance section of this contract. Very interesting. We're looking here, the buyer's obligation under this contract either is or is not contingent upon financing of a 30-year, 15-year, or other purchase money loan at a reasonable prevailing market terms with loans equal to amounts to a maximum percent of the purchase price or appraised value, whichever is lower. This is known as your financing contingency. So what have we just said? The contract is either contingent or not contingent on getting financing. What I see sometimes when I review these contracts is on the front of the contract, they will say it's cash but then the finance section is filled out. Or the front will say finance and cash or finance and then there'll be nothing here. So be sure that your what you put on the front matches what this is. So if it is contingent on financing, you want to check the box, it is. If it is not because you have cash, then your check is not. And then the rest of the blanks you put in A. But if it's contingent on getting a mortgage, then you put it is contingent. And then you need to check a box. Is it a 30-year, a 15-year, or other? Most, most of the time, probably 99% of the time, it's going to be a 30-year. And then the other, if it's a 30-year mortgage, you put NA in that blank after other. And then they talk about reasonable prevailing market terms. What's reasonable? What's reasonable to you might be one thing. What's reasonable to me is another thing. So be careful. If you have a buyer who has indicated to you they are not going to pay over a certain percent uh, interest rate. You need to put that in the contract. And there's a special addendum, it's called Clauses for Amendment, it's a state form, that has a section in it 
for you to address that. I emphasize if your buyer is mentioning that to you at all, you need to put it in that addendum because this contract by itself is not going to protect him. If he can qualify for the higher rate, you have not protected him unless you use that addendum. Notice it says you're putting in a loan equal amounts to a maximum percent of the purchase price, appraised value. So if somebody's getting a 90% loan, they put 90%, 90 there. If they get a 100% loan, you put 100%, 100 there. Then it goes on to say the financing contingency expires at closing. We all have learned that you have no loan until closing. You don't have 100% approval until you go to closing. Then we say buyer must make timely, good faith efforts to apply for and obtain financing while reframing from contrary actions. This would be the financing effort. In a timely manner, buyer shall inform the seller and brokers of pertinent financing issues and authorize the buyer's lender to disclose pertinent loan information to the sellers and brokers. It's a financing disclosure. A lot of times you call a lender and the loan officer will tell you that that's confidential information they cannot share with you. You sometimes have to copy and paste into an email this section of the contract where the buyers have authorized the buyer's lender to disclose pertinent loan information to the sellers and the brokers. Buyers shall apply for financing by a specific date. You put the date in there. If they've already gotten a pre-approval through maybe Prosperity and their Buyer Advantage program, then you can just put NA there, but that's going to be highly unusual. You put a date, usually just a calendar date that's a couple days away is the most, and shall deliver notice to seller of a reasonable pre-final loan approval. That is a lender pre-approved documentation, a lender immediate approval documentation that contains no unreasonable credit, income, or asset conditions by a certain date. From the effective date, no repairs are required prior to this notice. So exactly what are we saying here? We're talking about a reasonable pre-final loan approval. And it specifically spells out what that is. It is a lender pre-approval documentation or a lender intermediate approval documentation, which means that they have been through uh, some underwriting process and are pre-approved. It's not simply that the loan officer has spoken to the client and gathered information and said based upon what they've told him, they are pre-qualified. There's a big difference in pre-qualification and pre-approval. So again, a pre-qual is when a loan officer talks to a client and just works the numbers to pre-qualify them. They have not verified anything. A pre-approval is when the loan officer gathers documentation to support the conversation and pulls credit. There's a big difference. So, what date should you put here? Where do you come up with the date? You don't need to put two days from the approval date unless they have already been pre-approved by the lender. And that doesn't happen very often when somebody makes an application. Prosperity Mortgage does offer that at Buy Advantage where they have the individual completely approved. But I don't know of any other lender that is doing that right now. So what I suggest is you look for the effective date, excuse me, you look for the closing date that you've chosen in the contract already. And you count back about 10 days maybe, 8 to 10 days, and put that date there. Gives you plenty of time to get that pre-approval from the lender. And then we go on to say, if the buyer changes their lender, excuse me, go back for a second. Final loan approval occurs only when the lender funds the loans, as we said earlier. You have your final loan approval at closing, basically. If the buyer changes their lender during the financing period, they must notify the seller in writing within blank calendar days. What would you put there? Uh, two. Some people put three. But you need to notify the seller pretty quickly. So absent written approval by the seller, the buyer cannot change the lender if the closing date agreed upon in paragraph 4 will change as a direct result. Make sure your buyer knows this when they are writing the offer, when they're selecting their um, lender. Let me emphasize here, but if they put in there that the lender is going to be to be determined, and then later they pick a lender, this phrase, a sentence, applies. They would have to let the seller know who the lender is. If a lender declines or fails to approve financing, the buyer shall notify the seller and brokers as soon as possible. If the seller and brokers are notified of inability to obtain financing due, during the financing period, either party may terminate this contract by notice.
Now we're going to move into who the lender is and what type of loan. So you put in here who your lender is going to be. And again, if you put to be determined, and when the buyer decides on the lender, you have to notify the seller. They have to know who the lender is. We decide here, or we identify here, whether it's going to be an FHA loan, a VA loan, a conventional loan, seller, or other. Guys, it's going to be one. It's not going to be a combination of these. It'll be one or the other. Check a box. An FHA VA financing addendum it either is or is not attached. Check a box. Either it's there or it's not there. If you have an FHA or VA loan, then you need to say it is there and you need to complete the addendum and include it with the offer. Additional financing terms either are or are not attached. Check a box. They either are or are not. And remember, if your buyer is doing a conventional loan, for example, on the other, you would put N.A. If they're doing a V.A. loan, F.H.A., a seller, on the other line, you put N.A. Do not leave blank lines on the contract. Now we're going to stop and take a few quizzes, three short quizzes, really. But if you need help, you are welcome to go back through the material or to look at your contract when trying to answer the questions. Good luck. I'm going to give you about 20 minutes to take care of this.
Let's look at the answers to the quiz one. Time is of the essence is for all stipulated dates and times in this contract. True or false? True. Number two. Effective date is the final date upon which a party to the negotiation places the final and required signatures and or initials and date on this contract. True or false? This is false because remember the effective date. It has to be all signed, initial, dated, and delivered before it's effective. The name for the closing attorney is to be placed on page one of this contract. True. Now remember there's a blank for you to put in the name of the attorney that's going to be doing the closing. Number four. On page one, buyers and sellers acknowledge receipt of the South Carolina Disclosure of Brokerage Relationship form and is receiving blank. The answer here is D, is it David, A or B. They are receiving either client service or customer service. Remember, it is essential that they initial the spot on the contract and they declare which service they are expecting to receive. Now let's look at quiz two. Take your time, go through it, find the, answers, find the answers yourself, and then we will go over it.
Now, let's look at the answers for quiz two. Number one, all days or dates referenced in this contract are blank. The answer is D is in David, B or C. They're either calendar days or a specific date. Number two, if the contingency of the contract is not met, the buyer will get his earnest money returned to him. Answer is maybe. How do we get earnest money returned? Either an agreement by both parties who gets the money or a judge says so. So maybe. Just because we think the buyer should get the earnest money or the seller should get the earnest money, it doesn't matter what we think. In this contract, seller may pay buyer's costs not to exceed blank percent of the purchase price. This is false. Remember, there's a dollar amount, not a percent. Number four, in this contract, who pays for all costs to obtain information from or pertaining to owners' associations, private public transfer fees, and any cost similar to transfer fees? That is your certificate of assessment, capital contributions, working capital, estoppel fees, and otherwise named but similar fees. The answer is C. Selection is decided in the contract. You choose either buyer or seller. And remember, if you don't select one or the other, it reverts to the seller. Now we take quiz three. Take your time, go through. If you don't know the answer, find the answers.
Now we move on to the answers for quiz three. Under finance, there is no longer a place to state the minimum loan to value. That is true. You only put the maximum in there now. Can a corporation or partnership be a party to a real estate contract? Yes, they can be a party. You just have to watch out for the signature part. By what authority can a person sign for and thereby bind a corporation or partnership? Any of the above is the answer. Once a party signs a counter offer, accepting the terms in the counter offer, is that day the effective date? No. Remember, it has to be delivered. SCR 504, which is the addendum for the sale of a property, is the standard form for use with a buyer who needs to sell in order to buy. The answer is true. You should never write your own, but use SCR 504. Six, seller must maintain the property from effective date through closing. True. Remember, the contract says the seller must maintain the property with no more wear and tear. Now that we have this section of the contract down, let's move forward. This next section is got to be one of the most exciting parts of the contract. Let's move on to the next section of the contract. This will be our repair section. Wow, this is probably, if I had to guess or say something, I would say this is probably the most important part of the contract, that you understand thoroughly what's going on with this. As we talk about repairs, we're going to talk about repair procedure, due diligence, and as is. I just want to make sure everybody, and this will be repeated, everybody gets it, that repair procedure, you do not ask for silly things. And we'll go specifically through what the buyer is allowed to ask for under repair procedure. And a due diligence, you can ask for anything. Even if you don't like the color of the hair, you can get out of the contract for anything on due diligence. On as is, there's no way to get out of the contract except, and I'll talk about how, one possible way and when we get to that section I will discuss that in more detail. So obviously from what I've said so far, due diligence would be the best route for your buyer client. If you have a buyer who's a client, due diligence would be the best route. And there can be times when you do a due diligence contract and the listing agent or the seller comes back and says, we're not accepting due diligence. You must go repair procedure. So if we want to do that, we need to make absolutely sure you understand and can explain to your buyers what it means, what the difference is. At the top of this section, you see number eight repairs. All this is in all caps, bold. Supposed to be let you know how important this paragraph is. Check only one of the following options. If no boxes are checked, this contract will be an as-is contract in regard to repairs. If multiple boxes are checked, then the first paragraph of the checks box will determine the repairs. So if you are one of these that leaves boxes on your contract unchecked, and believe me, there are a lot of folks that tend to do that, if you leave all the boxes unchecked, your buyer client is going to end up with an as-is contract. And believe me, most buyers do not want an as-is contract. So for goodness sakes, whatever you do, check one of these boxes. Check the box that your buyer client wants the route they want to go. I've also seen where the contract started out as a due diligence contract and the seller would not accept a due diligence, so they changed to repair procedure but they left both boxes checked. In that case, they ended up being okay because the rule is the first of the boxes checked are the one that will apply. But don't do that. Strike out the due diligence, initial it, and check the repair procedure box and go from there. Next, we go to the repair procedure section. If this is what your buyer would like, then you put a check or X in this box. Mark the box. Check the box. Okay, let's see what is repair procedure. All repair procedure inspections and requests shall be completed and delivered to the seller by 6 p.m. on a specific date. Here you pick a specific date. And typically we are looking at, well, it just depends on how busy the home inspectors are, what date you'd put here. But typically um, 10 to 15 days out to have this done. 
because the date that you put here is also the date that the repair addendum has to be presented to the seller. It's all the one and same date. So you have to have the inspection and have to have your repair addendum all prepared to give to the seller by this date. Now it goes into exactly what can the buyer expect the seller to repair or fix. It specifically states them, any and all requests necessary to place the heating systems, air conditioning systems, electrical systems, plumbing systems, water supply systems, water waste systems, to be conveyed in operative condition to make the roof free of leaks, to address environmental concerns, and to make the improvement structurally sound, known as repair request, shall be delivered by the date above. If the buyer fails to notify the seller within this time frame, the buyer shall have waived any and all rights under the terms of this section. Critical statement. Critical statement. You need to make sure your buyer is aware of this last statement and that you stay on top of it with the buyer getting this date fulfilled, getting the inspection done and the repair addendum filled out and given to the listing agent. There's probably no feeling so desperate as if you're the agent, the buyer's agent, and you let this date go by, then the buyer has waived all their rights under this section. That's a pretty scary situation to find yourself in, so don't find yourself there. Let's go back and talk about these uh, repairs that we can expect the seller to take care of. It's important that you realize they're saying that these items, the air conditioning, the heating system, electrical system, plumbing systems, water supply systems, water waste systems, are to be conveyed in operative condition. They don't have to be new. They don't have to be really good. They just have to be operating. And your buyer needs to be aware that that's all the seller has to provide. Also, please note to make the roof free of leaks. It doesn't say to fix the roof, to repair the leaf, roof. As long as the roof doesn't leak, that's all the seller's responsible for. If when you look at the house and make the offer, you're suspicious that the roof looks really old and in bad shape, your buyer really needs to be going due diligence if they're going to think they're going to get the seller to fix the roof. As long as it doesn't leak, the seller's not responsible to do anything else. The same is really true with the air conditioning system. Maybe it's 15, 16, 17 years old. More than likely, it's going to start to have problems. But as long as it's operating right now, just operating, is all the seller's responsible for on a repair procedure. Too many times I hear, but the buyer really needs that air conditioning replaced. It's too old. Well, you should have gone due diligence on a repair procedure. As long as it's operating, the seller is not required to fix it or to make it new, basically. It has to be operating. That is it. Now that we beat that horse to death, let's move on. If the lender's commitment requires any additional inspections or certifications, these are to be provided by the buyer. The buyer at the buyer's expense shall have the privilege and responsibility of inspecting the structure, the square footage, the environmental concerns, including but not limited to mold, radon gas, lead-based hazards, including lead-based paints, wetlands study, appurtenant buildings, heating systems, air conditioning systems, electrical systems, plumbing systems, water supply systems, water waste systems, as well as the pertinent equipment or appliances. Upon the seller's request, the buyer will provide the seller with a copy of the inspection report. So it's listing all the things it's the buyer's responsibility to inspect and check out. It's also telling the buyer right here that if the seller requests a copy of the inspection report, they will agree to give it to them. They are agreeing by signing this contract to give it to them. We've been talking about the buyer's responsibility with repair procedure. Now let's look at the seller side. No later than 6 p.m. on a specific date. You pick the date. When you're selecting the date, be mindful of the fact that if, especially if the buyer is going to be asking for a lot of repairs, the seller is going to need time to get estimates on these repairs before responding. So keep that in mind. You should give the seller at least five days I'd say at least five to ten days after they have received the repair request from you above. So in picking the dates, be careful about that. Okay, so no later than 6 p.m. on a specific date, the seller shall deliver notice agreeing or not agreeing to make repairs in the buyer's repair request. Notice it says it will deliver notice of agreeing or not agreeing. So it's giving the seller the option to not agree to the specific request mentioned above. 
the cost of all repairs to heating systems, air conditioning systems, electrical systems, plumbing systems, water supply systems, water waste systems, making these systems operable, making the roof free of leaks, address environmental concerns, and to make the improvements structurally sound to be paid by the seller. These are called seller paid repairs. Specifically, seller paid repairs do not include the following items. Home maintenance, flooring, fogged windows, grandfathered coat issues, landscaping, preventive maintenance, cosmetics, home improvement, energy efficiency. If the seller contractually agrees to make the requested repairs, the parties agree to proceed under the amended contract. The repairs to any of the items are the sole responsibility of the buyer. It says if the seller agrees to make the repairs. You need to make sure your buyer understands up front that this repair, seller paid repairs, does not include fog windows. Uh, lots of things that a lot of people think that, oh, those windows are all fogged up, they've got to be replaced. No, not under repair procedure, they don't. I want to point out again that you should point out to your buyers. It says, if the seller contractually agrees to make the repairs, not that he has to make them, but if he agrees to make them. So you need to be aware of that. Now let's look. At, if the seller does not timely respond per above, or does not agree to make the seller paid repairs, the buyer shall within two calendar days choose any of the following options. So two calendar days after the date that the seller was supposed to respond, the buyer has at two calendar days to make a decision. Number one, either accept the property in its present condition. Two, negotiate a new amended contract with the seller for the payment of the repairs or the price. Or three, terminate this contract by delivered notice. If buyer fails to accept, renegotiate a new amended contract with the seller, or terminate contract by delivering notice within these two calendar days, the buyer agrees to buy and the seller agrees to sell as is. More than likely, your buyer is not planning to buy this house as is, especially if they've submitted a repair addendum. So remember, if the seller has not responded by the date that you put in for the seller's response, then your buyer only has two calendar days after that date to determine what they're going to do. If they don't do something in those two days, either renegotiate the contract or accept it or terminate within those two calendar days, the buyer agrees to buy it and the seller agrees to sell as is. Pretty scary thought. Let's look at the definition for as is. It's mentioned several times in this contract. Parties will agree that as is means buyer buys the property for the purchase price while seller maintains the property from the effective date through closing so that to normal wear, otherwise without repair or replacement, and sells the property for the purchase price unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by the parties in this contract. The obligations of the seller for repairs terminates upon closing. To me, I've always found it interesting that this is in the contract, that the obligations for the seller for repairs terminates upon closing. We would all like to believe that really happens, but unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. So many times after closing, if something comes up fairly shortly after closing, that buyer is going to go back and want the seller to take care of it. And even though the contract said that wasn't going to happen, it does. And the easiest thing most times is for someone to fix it, to keep from having a lawsuit. It's today's society that we live in, a very litigious society. And you're probably thinking right now, well, who is going to pay for those? What if the seller refuses but to we're pay? We're now going to start looking at the And the buyer is really upset and going to do something. Well, a lot of times, unfortunately, the real estate agents end up ch chiming in or pitching in to get it settled, stay out of a lawsuit. Let's go back and recap repair procedure. First of all, there are three dates you have to keep up with, right? There's your first date for the home inspection. That same date, your repair addendum has to be ready to give to the seller or the listing agent for the seller. That's the first date. And then you have a date that you've given the seller that they have to respond as whether they're going to agree or not agree. I should say they're supposed to respond. But then in the event they don't respond by that date, the buyer has two calendar days after that to terminate, agree, or whatever, or they are buying the property as is. And remember, under repair procedure, the seller 
does not have to do certain things, and those are specifically listed in this contract. They do not have to replace fog windows, and that's probably the most common thing that's asked for that's not on the list. And remember that the things that they do are supposed to fix, called subtle paid repairs, they only have to be operative. That's it. The word operative is very important. And the roof only has to be free of leaks. The roof can be 20 years old and in terrible shape, but as long as it's not leaking, that's all the seller is saying in this repair procedure. These are very important points for you to remember, keep up with, and make sure your buyer understands. It is also, I'm told by Byron King, the attorney for the South Carolina Association of Realtors, that repair procedure is not intended to use money in lieu of repairs. Now, I've seen a lot of people do that. Of course, if buyer and sellers agree to it, it's not, I mean, they've agreed to it, so there. But it is not intended to be used for that money in lieu of repairs. I think a lot of buyer clients kind of get pushed into repair procedure when that was not their first choice. Your obligation is to make sure that if that happens, that that buyer understands what repair procedure is. And they don't go under the false impression that they're going to be able to ask for anything they want. I guess they can always ask, but the seller is not obligated by the contract to do any of those things. And quite honestly, if you remember, under repair procedure, the seller is not obligated to do anything anyway. So those specific re repairs are the ones that you are supposed to be able to ask the seller for. But remember, he doesn't have to do them. So in a final recap, before we head into due diligence, Remember, there are three dates you have to keep up with and repair procedure. The inspection date, also the date that your repair addendum has to go to the listing agent and seller. Then the date that the seller is supposed to agree or not agree to pick whatever repairs. If the seller does not agree to do the repairs, then the buyer has two calendar days to decide what they want to do. Or they're buying the property as is. First thing you want to do is put an X and check in this box by due diligence, meaning that this is the repair selection your buyer has chosen. The diligence period begins upon the effective date and shall expire at 6 p.m. on a specific date. You pick the date. So it begins the day the contract is ratified. Remember the definition of effective date and it ends whatever date you put here. It ends at 6 p.m. on that date. I'd say pretty average thing there is 15 days say 15 to 20 calendar days, because it's calendar days we're talking about here that you're counting. So you want to give the buyer time to get their inspections and present the repair addendum and negotiate that. All that has to be done before this date that you put in here. So be careful in choosing your date and make sure you, you and the buyers are satisfied with what you have chosen. Let's go on to say that any extension to the state must be made in writing and agreed to by both parties. So if you need to extend that date, you can do that with an addendum, but it has to be agreed, must be in writing and agreed by both parties. This verbal stuff means nothing when it comes to legal contracts. So what really is due diligence? Due diligence is your buyer can have a property inspected, home inspector, check the land, the survey, anything they want to check about it. How close is it to the ocean? How close is it to the best restaurant? How close to the schools? They can't check out anything they want to check. And if anything that they're checking does not suit them, they can terminate the contract. That is basically due diligence, which is very different from repair procedure. On repair procedure, procedure the buyer is only to ask for certain things to be repaired or fixed. And due diligence, they can ask for anything. They can ask the seller to change the color of their hair. That is ridiculous, of course, but they can ask for anything that they want. The seller can say no, or they maybe say yes. So it's pretty easy to see why due diligence would be a preference preferred over repair procedure if you have a buyer client, where you're supposed to be doing everything in the world to protect their interest. And certainly due diligence would do that. I think you can see that now. During the due diligence period, the buyer may take timely, prudent steps to help the buyer slash inspectors, the seller slash estimators, and realtors all have adequate time for buyer to coordinate inspections and repair requests 
for the seller to obtain repair estimates, for buyer and seller to negotiate repairs, and buyer to potentially, timely, properly, due diligence, terminate, or buy. As we said earlier, the date that you put for the due diligence date is one that during that period of time, your buyer has to have all the inspections they want to have, prepare the repair estimate or repair addendum, get it to the seller, negotiate with the seller about the repairs. All this has to be done for 6 p.m. on the date that you have put in the contract. Next, it says, during the due diligence period, the seller agrees buyer may rely on the following list of five items in accordance with the contract and laws. The buyer is solely responsible for inspections. The buyer is not required to inspect until the buyer timely, properly terminates the contract or the parties agree on an amended contract. The buyer can rely on number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. Time is of the essence. Delivering a repair request does not extend the due diligence period. I'll say that again. Delivering a repair request does not extend the due diligence period. As we said earlier, that date that you put in there, everything has to be done and finalized. The, the inspection is done, the repair addendum submitted, negotiated, come to a final conclusion, all of that before the 6 p.m., the date that you have put in the contract for due diligence. Number one is to conduct to obtain inspections, that is on-site conditions, off-site conditions, any kind of inspections they want to do. They have a right to do that, any kind. Number two, deliver repair request notice to the seller. That's your repair addendum. That's SCR 525. With all repair requests, all portions of reports, everything doing the same time. Number three, to proceed under an amended contract, that's SCR 310 and SCR 525, 390, or 391. You can use addendums, different contract addendums, once you come to negotiating the repairs and what you want to do. Number four, proceed under an as-is contract. That means the buyer decides to buy anyway. The buyer wants a property without repairs. That's the buyer's choice. Or five, terminate the contract by timely, properly delivering notice of termination and a termination fee. You cannot terminate a contract unless you have delivered notice of termination and a termination fee. It's very important. Now let's take a look at the termination. During the due diligence period, the buyer may unilaterally terminate this contract only by delivering to the seller both notice of termination and a termination fee of blank dollars. So what do you put here? If you have a buyer client then more than likely you want to put as little as possible. I'll tell you the intent of this is that you give the seller some money for taking the property off the market while the buyer does all their inspections. So even though a dollar is good for your buyer client, it's not really too good for the seller. So if you have a listing, then you might want to counter that fee. If somebody puts a dollar, a zero, you might want to counter and put a higher number there so the seller is reimbursed for taking the house off the market. But most buyer agents will put a dollar. I will caution you that Byron King of the South Carolina Association of Realtors says it needs to be something of value. I will give you that dollar is not much, but it is something of value. So according to Byron King, zero is not a good thing to put there. If you put zero, Byron says, and it ever goes to court, the judge is probably going to rule against you because zero is nothing of value. Let's talk a little bit about the termination. During the due diligence period, the buyer can unilaterally, that means the buyer only has to sign it in order for the contract to be terminated. They can terminate any time during the due diligence period. Once that six o'clock comes on the day that you put for the due diligence period to end, once that comes, they can no longer terminate because you have to do it during the due diligence period. You have to terminate before 6 p.m. on the date that you put here in the contract. And you can only terminate by delivering to the seller, only by delivering to the seller, both the notice of termination and a termination fee of whatever you put in the contract. Let me say now that when you're writing the offer 
you have your buyer write a check directly to the seller, not to the escrow agency, but to the seller for whatever amount of termination fee you put in here. If you put a dollar, the check would be for a dollar. If it was a hundred dollars, the check is for a hundred dollars. But the check is written to the seller. I recommend that you hold on to it. Actually, not you, because it's illegal for you to hold on to money from somebody else's. But you can turn it into the office admin, and they have a special file they keep it in until you need it later. You will even need it if they terminate the contract, or if they don't terminate the contract, then the buyer would get that check back. Another suggestion from Byron King, he suggests that you might want to, if it's a dollar check or whatever, staple that check to your offer when you deliver it to the listing agent. That way the listing agent has it in case you want to terminate later. That was just a suggestion. I've heard, I've mentioned this before. I've heard lots of comments that they don't like it and some people think it's a great idea. Whatever, if you think it's a great idea, you might use it. If not, then don't. The problem comes in is when your buyer needs to terminate and you have to get that fee along with the notice of termination to the listing agent immediately, which gets it to the seller immediately. You have to deliver that fee along with it. And that became, becomes a pain sometimes when the listing agent is, has an office in her or his home and difficult to get to, or the listing agent on completely on the other side of town from where you are. It can be a problem. But then it really is a problem when you're delivering the offer as well. But when you're delivering the offer, typically you have more time than when you're trying to terminate because much of the time you're trying to terminate at five minutes till six, which is not really a good idea, but it happens a lot. During the due diligence period, should the buyer fail to obtain a new amended contract with the seller, or the buyer fail to timely, properly due diligence terminate the contract during the due diligence period, the buyer agrees to buy and seller agrees to sell the property as is. Parties agree that as is means the buyer buys the property for the purchase price while seller maintains the property from the effective date through closing, subject to normal wear, otherwise without repair or replacement, and sells the property for the purchase price unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by the parties in this contract. What we're saying here that if your buyer does not terminate by 6 p.m. on the day that you put in the contract, your buyer will be buying the property as is. They've got to negotiate a contract and come to an agreement before 6 p.m. or they're buying it as is. This is scary. We had a situation with one of our agents I had a buyer client and the buyer needed to terminate because they at the last minute couldn't get things ironed out. The buyer sent it to the buyer's agent. She gets it at two minutes till 10. She sends it straight over to the listing agent who gets it at two minutes after 10. And at that time, due diligence termination was 10 a.m. That was not a pretty sight. There was a lot of arguing going over about that. And what ended up happening was the seller finally agreed to split the security uh, earnest money. And the buyer was really upset and wanted all the earnest money, of course, because in their mind, they were terminating the agreement. So in the long in the end, the buyer's agent ended up paying half of that earnest money, which was over two thousand dollars, because the buyer's agent did not get it to the listing agent in time. And yes, it was partially the buyer's fault because they didn't get it back to the listing agent until two minutes till ten, but still it became a real problem. The moral of the story? Pay attention to your dates and get everything worked out at least an hour before. You should be ready to submit a termination notice an hour before. So at 5 o'clock, you should be ready to submit a termination notice. You should have it signed, have that and the fee ready to go in case the seller has not responded back. And that's what happens a lot of times. The seller just will uh, just sit back and not respond to your request. This is also why it's important to submit your repair addendum early. Don't wait to the day before due diligence terminates to submit it. If a seller has a backup contract for a higher price, they could just sit back and never respond. And you're sitting there thinking, well, they have to respond. No, they don't have to respond. If they don't respond and you don't terminate by 6 p.m. on that date, termination date you put in there, then you're buying the house as is, Mr. Buyer. So make sure your buyers understand that. 
that is critical that they understand what needs to be done. So when you're setting your dates in the beginning for your due diligence date, leave enough time to make sure you get all the inspections done and everything the buyer wants to check out, and then time to, to include negotiating with the seller. Sometimes the seller has to get estimates on repairs before they give you an answer, so they need more than a day, especially with the calendar days, if it's a Saturday or a Sunday. You need to take all those things into consideration. Due diligence is definitely the best approach for your buyer client, as long as your buyer and you understand what has to be done. It is absolutely imperative. The date you put in there is a drop-dead date. If you don't have everything negotiated by that date, your buyer is buying it as is. So, big responsibility on your shoulders. Make sure this is all taken care of. Before we go on, let's talk again, due diligence versus repair procedure. And I know y'all think I'm crazy and beating this to death, but I know how important it is that you explain it correctly to your buyers. They need to be knowing up front when you're writing the offer what the difference is so they can make the decision which way they want to go. And if there are multiple offers and you need to go repair procedure in order to get this contract through, again, that's something your buyer needs to be aware of and you need to explain what they're giving up by going from due diligence to repair procedure. Due diligence, there's one date to keep up with as far as the contracts are concerned and that's your date you put in there for the termination date of due diligence. With repair procedure, there are three dates you have to keep up with. In truth, in due diligence, there are more dates because you're going to have an inspection, you're going to have a pool inspection, you're going to have a this inspection. So there'll be things to keep up with. But as far as the contract's concerned, there's one date to keep up with. Repair procedure, remember there are three dates. You have your date for the inspection and the, by which time you have to have the repair addendum prepared. Then you have the date for the seller to respond. And then after that date, the buyer has two calendar days if the seller does not respond. Explain to your buyer that under due diligence, they can ask for anything. They can ask for light bulbs to be replaced. They can ask for anything, fog windows to be replaced. Under repair procedure, they're not supposed to ask for those kind of things. The specific items listed in the contract that they're supposed to ask for. And remember to tell the buyer that under repair procedure, the seller only needs to make the things operable and make the roof free of leaks. Those are things to point out and emphasize with your buyer. So at the end of the day, the buyer makes a decision which way they want to go. But you have thoroughly explained to them the difference between the two. Okay, let's move on. Let's discuss the as-is option that these buyers have. They have a repair procedure, due diligence, or as-is. This as-is clause, let's read it because it's scary when you stop and think about it and listen to what it says. First of all, if they're going to select the as-is, you would check the box beside that. It says all parties agree that the property is being sold as-is. It means the buyer buys the property for the purchase price, while the seller maintains the property from the effective date through closing, subject to normal wear without repair or replacement, and sells the property for the purchase price unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by the parties in this contract. Buyer retains the right to inspect the property by 6 p.m. on a specific date for informational purposes only. Informational purposes only. The seller is under no obligation to remedy any issues the buyer discovers during the inspections, and the buyer may not terminate the contract based on the results of any inspections conducted. This says the buyer may not terminate based on the inspections. So if somebody is signing this as-is section, they need to realize that they are buying it as-is. Why would a buyer of yours want to buy a property as-is? Yes, maybe the seller is saying it, I'm selling it as-is. But if that's the case and you have a buyer client, you should advise your buyer client to do a due diligence contract and uh, with writing in there that you understand the seller will make no repairs. That's fine. But your buyer needs a way to get out of the contract in case he finds something that's a disaster he was not expecting. This is a very scary thing. I don't see many of them, but I've seen a few, and it worries me every time I see one. Before we move on, let me remind you that in this section of the three choices, repair procedure, due diligence, as is, you need to check a box. If you do not check any boxes, 
you need to know that this contract will revert to a as-is contract. Very scary. Check a box. Also, remember, if you check two boxes, it's going to revert to the first of the two boxes that you checked. So if you check repair procedure and due diligence, it will end up being a repair procedure contract. Just be careful and check the right box, but check a box. Let me let you know that outside of these three options for repairs would fall financing, appraisal, and the CL100 letter. Those three are outside of repair procedure, outside of due diligence, and outside of as is. So as far as the as is section goes, the buyer, if they go with as is, the only protection they have is if they make the contract contingent upon a CL100 and there's something wrong with the CL100 that the seller refuses to fix, then the buyer can get out of the contract. Otherwise, they're stuck in this contract. Or if their financing falls through, or the appraisal comes in less, those three things would get them out of the as-is contract. That's all. This is a good time to remind you that if you have the listing and somebody brings you an as-is contract from the buyer and your seller truly intends and thinks it is truly an as-is contract, then it needs to be a cash contract. It needs to not, have, not be contingent on the CL100. So you need to pay attention to those things. Now we're going to move into the inspection paragraph, a section of the contract. The inspection rights. It says, buyer and South Carolina licensed and insured inspectors reasonably perform any reasonable, ultimately non-destructive examination and make reasonable record of the property, property with reasonable notice to the seller through closing, including investigations of off-site conditions and any related to the property at the buyer's expense. This would be inspections. The buyer and persons they choose may make reasonable visual observations of the property. Here again, we go with something very subjective. What's reasonable? Reasonable to me is probably different than reasonable to you. But this is saying that they will, buyer's expense, will be able to investigate all these different things. The sellers will make the property accessible for inspection and not unreasonably withhold access unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by the parties. The seller will grant the buyer the right to perform a final walkthrough inspection of the property within 24, excuse me, 48 hours prior to the closing date. Seller will keep all utilities operational through closing unless otherwise agreed. Note that this paragraph, the seller is granting the buyer the right to perform the final walkthrough inspection. Guys, never go to a closing without doing a walkthrough inspection. I don't care which side you're on, the buyer side or the seller side. There always needs to be a walkthrough inspection. And I worry about doing it the day before closing. Some people do that. But I worry about it because I'll tell you what happened. We had a situation. We had the buyer and our agent took the buyers over the afternoon before to do a walkthrough because the buyers really wanted to do it the day before the closing. So they did. But our agent, knowing how things can happen, ran by the house herself the next day on the way to the closing. And what did she find? She found that there had been a terrible leak through the ceiling. It was a condo, and the whole place was flooded. Had they not, she not gone back by that unit, the buyers would have closed, and they'd have gone home to their new home to find a mess. So if you do the inspection prior to closing, someone needs to run by that property on the way to closing or just before closing to make sure everything is still the same way it was the day before. And back up at the top of this paragraph, they're saying that they can perform any reasonable, ultimately non-destructive examination. So the seller is given permission for the buyers to have inspectors, inspectors go inspect the home to do non-destructive examinations. We had a situation one time where we had the listing and the buyer's inspectors went out and they were suspicious of something on the wall. So they proceeded, the inspector proceeded to cut out a hole in the wall to check behind the wall. Well, he did not fix it back. And when the seller got home, there was a hole in the wall. And of course, the seller was very upset. Obviously, the seller did not get permission for them to cut a hole in the wall. This also says the seller will keep all utilities operational through closing. And then right under it, it says the seller grants the buyer permission to connect utilities, pay for utilities, and hire professionals to safely connect and operate the utilities during the inspections. 
This would only come into play if the house is vacant or if the utilities have been turned off. You, if that's the case, then you would put initials beside that. But typically, if the people are still living in the house, this wouldn't apply because they have the utilities still on. And of course, if it doesn't apply in your situation as a blank line, what do you put there? N A. And also under there, other and C attached. That's if you want to attach some things, you would check that box. If not, most of the time these are left blank. You just put N A in those blanks. Okay. The buyer will hold harmless, indemnify, pay damages, and attorney fees to seller and brokers for all claims, injuries, and damages arising out of the exercise of these rights. Seller will hold harmless, indemnify, pay damages, and attorney fees to brokers for all claims, injuries, and damages arising out of the exercise of these inspection rights. Brokers recommend that parties obtain all inspections as soon as possible. Brokers recommend that the parties and inspectors use insurance to manage the risk. This is saying if the inspectors cause damage or whatever, the buyer's going to hold the seller harmless and the brokers harmless. If the seller will also hold the brokers harmless for any accident or whatever. Like in the example I just gave about the inspector cutting a hole in the wall. The inspector refused to fix it, but the buyer had to pay to have the wall fixed. Inspections are very important. They are critical. Please make sure that you strongly advise your buyers to have inspections. They need to know what they're buying. Even if the seller is not going to fix anything, the buyer should still have an inspection. They need to know what they're buying. Inspections are so important that quite a few real estate companies have forms that the buyers have to sign saying that the agent has advised inspection. My skin crawls when an agent comes in and says, my buyer does not want to have an inspection. He can look at it himself and he feels very comfortable by looking at it himself. Now, unless your buyer is a licensed contractor, that is not a very smart thing to do. So hopefully, if that happens to you, you can talk them out of that and talk them into having an inspection. Some people are just so thrifty, they don't want to pay for an inspection. That's very dangerous. When you're spending, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for a property, you certainly need to have it inspected to make sure you know what you're buying. Now let's move into the appraised value. Number 10. Either it's contingent on the appraisal or not contingent. First of all, we're going to look at the contingent on appraised value. So hopefully, it will be contingent on the appraised value. If it is, you check the box. This contract is contingent upon the property being valued according to the lender's appraisal or other appraisal as agreed upon by the parties for the purchase price or higher. So if someone's paying cash, they still have the option of making it contingent on the appraisal and the parties just agree on who the appraiser is. Typically, most of the time our deals are going to be with financing, so the lender picks the appraiser. Please, guys, don't get caught telling your buyer that you know it's a good deal. They don't need an appraisal. It's a good deal. You pull the comps and you give them the comps and say, this shows you it's a good deal. That is a very, very dangerous thing to do, and please do not do that. It goes on to say, if the parties are made aware that the appraised value is less than the purchase price, and the seller delivers notice to the buyer within five calendar days of the closing or closing, whichever is earliest, of an amendment to reduce the purchase price to the appraised value, the parties agree to proceed to closing under the terms of this contract with the purchase price amended to be the appraised value. What this is saying is if the parties are made aware that the appraisal came in low, it's less than the purchase price, and if the seller delivers notice to the buyer within five calendar days of being told that, that he is willing to take the lesser price, and then the buyers agree to go to closing. I know most of you are thinking, why wouldn't a buyer go if the appraisal was less? He was willing to pay more, so if the seller is willing to take less, then of course he will want to go. You would certainly think so. Then we say, if the seller is aware of the less value and refuses to reduce as stated above, the buyer may proceed to closing or terminate this contract by delivering notice of termination to the seller. I will say that typically what I see is if the appraisal comes in low, the buyer and seller typically will get together and negotiate the price. Unfortunately, I have seen deals fall apart because of this. The appraisal comes in low. The buyer does not have any extra money 
to pay more than the appraised value, even if they're willing to, and the seller absolutely has to have X dollars out of the deal. And so the deal will fall through, and the seller hopes to sell it to somebody else for a higher price. Because look, let's face it, guys, appraisers, appraisers, appraisals are just an opinion. It's a professional opinion of an appraiser, but it's just an opinion. And two different appraisers would probably give you two different values. We had one where the appraisal came in $27,000 less. The buyers had no money to put extra down. They were willing to pay more, but they did not have the money. And the seller absolutely refused to sell it for $27,000 less because they felt like it was worth more than what the appraiser said. So that deal fell through. Luckily, the appraisals don't come in low that often. So this is not a problem most of the time. But if it is a problem, it's a problem. My favorite saying is, nothing is a problem until it's a problem. Then think about that. Nothing is a problem until it's a problem. You can get by with things your whole life and never get in trouble for doing something wrong. But then again, you might get in trouble if you do something wrong. So I always encourage my agents to do the right thing. Be careful when you're writing your contract and make sure you cover your bases. So guys, please always recommend to your buyers that they have an appraisal. It is just the smart thing to do. Next we have the section where you check a box if it is not contingent on the property being valued at the appraised value. This is it's not. The other paragraph was it is contingent. Whatever the buyer wants to do, you check a box. Next we're going to look at the wood infestation report, more commonly known as a CL100, a termite letter. If the property is to be sold, has been previously occupied, this contract is either is contingent or it's not contingent upon getting the CL100. So first of all, you need to check the box. It is contingent or it is not contingent. Please, if you have a buyer client, always highly recommend that they make the contract contingent upon CL100. So then if it is contingent, then they would have the buyer or seller having the property inspected at their expense by a qualified, licensed, bonded pest control operator selected by the buyer or seller. So you're going to decide who is going to pay for it and who is going to select the person, the inspector, CL100 termite guy. Is a buyer and seller or buyer or seller going to pay for it? That's the first one, buyer or seller. And then the second is who is going to select it, buyer or seller. Typically, what you see is if the buyer is paying for it, the buyer selects it. If the seller is paying for it, the seller selects it. But I also see them where they have the seller paying for it, but the buyer selecting. So the, it can be done that way as well. Then it's who is going to get it to the closing attorney. So buyer or seller, check a box. They shall deliver timely notice of and shall deliver to closing a CL100 infestation report dated no earlier than 30 calendar days prior to closing, and no later than blank calendar days prior to closing. Let's talk about that for a second. In South Carolina, the CL100 is good for 30 days. This is why it says it will take it to the attorney no earlier than 30 calendar days prior to closing, and no later than blank calendar days prior to closing. So what do we want to put in that blank? It really depends on whether you have the buyer or seller. What we're doing today is talking about this contract as though you have a buyer client. So if you have a buyer client, you want to put it as close to the closing date as possible. The reason is that you don't want to have to do it a second time because it's only good for the 30 days. I will go ahead and say right now that if you have the seller, you don't want this being done two days before closing. You want it done at least 15 to 17 days before closing. Because if there's something wrong and the seller is not willing to fix it, as you'll find out in a minute, the buyer can back out. And if a seller is thinking everything's going along great, and then all of a sudden, three days before closing, the buyer backs out because he, he the seller, is not willing to fix some of the repairs that the CL100 letter is requesting. Therefore, the buyer can back out. And this is really so close to closing. So be careful with the number of days you put in there.
If the buyer is responsible for having the property inspected as indicated above, but does not have the property timely inspected for the report's required delivery time frame, the buyer waives any and all rights under the terms of this section. Hello. Okay. If the buyer is responsible for having the property inspected, if that was chosen, and they do not do it within the time frame that this paragraph talks about, they've waived any and all rights under this terms of, the sec of this section. So be really careful with this and make sure your buyer understands. You both need to really watch the number of days that you've put in this paragraph. It goes on to say, the seller makes no warranties with regard to matters covered by such infestation report or any other improvement unless specifically stated in this contract. Seller makes no warranties with regard to any of these matters. The conversation always come up about who should be selecting the inspector, who should be paying and selecting. Usually you want the seller to pay if you have the buyer, and you want the buyer to select. Well, who do you select? Do you select someone that has already has a termite bond on the property, or does your buyer get a totally different inspection? These are all things to consider. This is a good point, a good time to bring up the point that let your buyer order the CL100, not you. Because if you order it and something goes wrong, it will be your fault. You might say, well, I'll just give suggestions. Well, if you give suggestions, it's the same thing as ordering it almost. Because if something goes wrong, you'll be blamed for it. So let the buyer decide who to, to um, order the CL100 from. I will say that Cecil Hernandez, who is a field supervisor for the Department of Pesticide Regulation for Clemson University and oversees CR100 companies. He says that if there's a termite bond on the property, it makes sense to him to have that company do the CR100 letter because if there's a problem, they're going to need to fix the problem. The next paragraph goes in a lot of detail. If the wood infestation report reveals the presence of or damages by termite infestation or other wood destroying organisms, sellers shall remedy such deficiencies and shall furnish the buyer with a CL100 wood infestation report by a qualified, licensed, bonded pest control operator dated no earlier than 30 calendar days prior to closing that the property is free from infestation or any damage herein mentioned or documentation that the infestation has been treated and damage has been repaired as appropriate in a workmanlike manner on or before closing and reported by an appropriate licensee. State law and regulation controls CL100 issues. If the seller does not make the repairs and treatment, you see right there, if the seller does not make the repairs and treatment, the buyer shall have the option to accept the property in its present condition to negotiate with the seller for the payment of these repairs and treatment, or terminate this contract by delivering notice of termination to the seller. If the property to be sold has not been previously occupied, the seller will certify that the dwelling has been treated by soil poisoning for the prevention of termites and other wood destroying organisms, and shall provide at closing to the buyer a written certification from a qualified licensed bonded pest control operator. That has been treated. The obligations of the seller under this section terminate after the closing. The first part of this paragraph says that the seller shall remedy such deficiencies. You would think that means that they're going to fix the stuff. But then it goes on down to say if the seller does not make the repairs and the buyer has these options. There are a lot of very experienced agents that feel like that the CL100, the seller has to do what's on the CL100. If the contract is made contingent upon the CL100 and the seller doesn't make the repairs, then the buyer can get out. They have those options. That's what I was talking about earlier when we talked about CL100 being outside of repair procedure and due diligence and the as-is sections. It is outside. So if you don't want it to be outside of those and for this to come into play, you need to make sure that you make it not contingent on the CL100. But I don't advise you ever doing that. If you have a buyer client, you should always highly recommend that they have a CL100 letter done. And then when the letter comes back, if there are issues, they can address the issues at that time. Next, we move to the survey, title exam, elevation, and insurance section.
Brokers recommend the buyer have property surveyed, title examined, elevation wetlands beachfront determined, and appropriate insurance that is flood, flood contents, hazard, liability, owner's title, effective at closing, unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by parties, buyer to obtain new insurance policies by closing, and seller may cancel existing insurance after closing. Flood insurance, if required by lender or at buyer's option, shall be assigned to buyer with permission of the carrier and premium prorated to closing. Buyers are solely responsible to investigate pricing, availability, coverage, and requirements of insurance, that is flood, flood contents, hazard, liability, for the property prior to signing contract. Okay, let's go back and talk about this. It's very front. It says, we recommend, brokers recommend that the buyer have the property surveyed. Now, quite honestly, not many people do that anymore, but you should always recommend your buyers have the property surveyed. There are all kinds of things that could happen. Attorneys usually will tell the buyers that, oh, well, there's a map on of record, so they don't need a new survey. Well, I disagree with that because you never know what has been done to the property since that map was drawn and put on the records. Every buyer should have a new survey. There are things like maybe a pool was put in, and the pool actually goes over the property line because there was no fence there. And then the fence gets put up on somebody else's property. That's one example. Another example, we had an agent sell a particular house. The buyers bought the house just because it had this huge backyard on a pond. And they were really excited about the huge backyard because they were going to put a goldfish pond behind the house. The agent did recommend they get a survey, but they never did get the survey. So after closing, they find out that the land behind the house, between the house and the pond, was considered wetlands, and they couldn't do anything with it. They were very upset because they said they bought the house just because of the huge lot behind the house. They should have had a survey. They would have known that there was wetlands behind the house. So be careful. Always recommend a survey. This particular case, the buyers were honest and they did admit that the agent had stressed to them to get a survey and they admitted it was their fault. So we lucked out on that one. Many times a buyer doesn't get a survey because they don't want to spend the money. Survey, surveys are kind of expensive and for the last year or so they've been, the surveyors have been very backed up and takes them a long time to get around to doing the survey. However, all that being said, you should always strive, stress to your buyers to get a survey. Next, it talks about having the title examined. Well, I know if you're a lender, if you're getting a mortgage, they require that, and I, it would be hard for me to imagine anybody doing a closing, buying something without having the title examined. But then determine if it's um, elevation or wetlands, determine that. If your property is being surveyed, the surveyor could help with that. Then you definitely want to get your appropriate insurance, flood, a flood con and flood contents. If you are in a mandatory flood zone and getting a mortgage, it will be required. However, everybody in the low country really should get flood insurance. We're in, it's called the low country for a reason. So you should get flood insurance. If it's not mandatory zone, it's fairly inexpensive. We recommend that everybody get that flood insurance. Owner's title insurance is huge. I have a whole separate course on what is title insurance. So hopefully you'll take the time to take that course as well. There's some great examples in there that will really make your owners and buyers sit up and pay attention. Owner's title insurance is very important. The lender requires title insurance, so there's got to be a reason why they require it. Emphasize to your buyers the importance of owner's title insurance. Then the paragraph goes on to talk about flood insurance. And it's saying if it's required by the lender or at the buyer's option, shall be assigned to the buyer with permission of carrier and premium prorated to closing. I would be very careful at advising your buyers to assume a flood insurance policy. There's real danger in that. For example, someone may have flood insurance on their house and it's a crawl space house but then they enclose the garage. That insurance policy is 
unless they have updated it, which is very rare that a seller will update their policy, it could be not valid for the new buyer because it now is should be rated on the ground level and not the first floor of a crawl space. Before you recommend a buyer assume a flood insurance policy, talk to your insurance agent. Get information from them. Get the buyer to get information from them. Number 13, survival. If any provision herein contained, which by its nature or effect is required to be observed, kept, or performed after closing, it will survive the closing and remain binding upon the parties hereto until fully observed, kept, or performed. What in the world are we talking about? What could possibly survive the closing? An example might be, recently we had a contract. The buyer and seller had come to agreement on everything. The seller had promised to replace the windows in the house because they were fogged and it had been a due diligence contract and the seller had agreed to do this. Well, he altered the windows, but they had not come in. So he could not put them in before closing or the closing had to be delayed. The buyer was okay with them being put in after closing. So they had an attorney draw up an addendum that stated how many windows, what kind of windows, and exactly when they would be installed by a certain date. And that's the way they went to closing. But that, putting the windows in the house, survived the closing. Now the next section has to do the home warranty. Home warranty company optional coverage. They now refer to that as HWC. Parties agree that a home warranty ordered by blank with at least 12 months of coverage after the closing date either will or will not be provided by closing and blank dollars will be paid by blank to the home warranty company. Buyer to pay any deficit and surplus reverts to payer. The proposed home warranty company and type of home warranty is and it's a blank line for you to put in the name of the warranty and the type of plan that you're getting. Let's go back and look over this. They agreed that a home warranty ordered by blank, that blank would have typically the buyer is ordering it. Sometimes it says buyer's agent, but typically, and sometimes seller, but typically the buyer's agent or the buyer is doing the ordering. With at least 12 months of coverage, the warranty will either will or will not be provided by the closing. The next line is where you put the amount of the home warranty. Is it $500, $600, whatever the amount is would go there. And then who's going to pay for it? Typically, the buyer orders it and the seller pays for it. That's what most buyers write the offer that way anyway. So if the seller is paying for it, the word seller would go on that line. And then on the last line, you would put the type of warranty it is. Is it a gold plan? Is it an elite plan? What type is it? That should go there. Is it American Home Shield? Is it Global Home? That's what goes there. When we tell them, this is to give you notice that the brokers have, will, or may receive compensation from the home warranty company. You're not required to purchase a home warranty company or similar residential service contract. And if you choose to purchase such coverage, you're free to purchase it from another provider. This is disclosure to the buyers that this, you may be receiving compensation from the warranty company. Moving along to 15, fire or casualty or injury. In case the property is damaged wholly or partially by fire or other casualty prior to closing, the parties will have the right for five calendar days after the notice of damage to deliver notice of termination to the other party. If the party does not deliver notice of termination, the parties proceed according to the contract, and the seller is to be responsible to, number one, repair all damage, two, remit to buyer an amount for repairs, or three, assign to buyer the right to all proceeds of insurance and remit any deductible amount applicable to such casualty. If the buyer or inspections cause the damage, buyer is responsible for indemnifying the seller for damages. Brokers and parties should ensure that they are protected by appropriate risk management strategies such as insurance. Let's go back and look at this paragraph. It says if the property is damaged wholly or partially by fire or the casualty, like hurricanes, the parties will have the right for five calendar days after the notice of damage, not after the problem came, but the notice of the problem, to deliver notice of termination to the other party. Here's the biggie. If the party does not deliver notice of termination, 
The parties proceed according to the contract, and the seller is to be responsible for one of these things. Repair the damage, remit to buyer, an amount for repairs, or assign to buyer the right to all proceeds. Here's the potential issue with this paragraph. The parties, meaning either party, buyer or seller, will have the right for five calendar days after the notice of damage to terminate the contract. So we had a situation, or knew of a situation, where actually there was over a million dollar property. The hurricane came through, damaged the roof a little bit, not much at all. The buyer was really willing to accept it without anything being done. But the seller gave notice to the buyer and then the seller terminated the contract because he had a backup contract for more money. Several attorneys got involved in this and it was decided that he had a right to do that. So be careful with this. Just don't ignore it. Next, we look at number 16 on the contract. The South Carolina Residential Property Condition Disclosure Statement. It's called CDS. And this instruction says, check a box. Check one. It's either or, not both. Either or. First of all, it's buyer and seller agree that the seller has delivered prior to this contract a CDS to the buyer as required by the South Carolina Code of Laws, section 2750-10. Please note that we said this is saying that the seller has delivered prior to the writing of this offer. So you need to make sure, absolutely sure, you get the property disclosure, download it from MLS, and have your buyer have read it before he writes this offer, he or she. If after delivery, the seller discovers a CDS material inaccuracy or the CDS becomes materially inaccurate due to an occurrence or circumstance, the seller shall promptly correct this inaccuracy, that is delivering a corrected CDS to the buyer or making reasonable repairs prior to closing. So if something happens after the original CDS is written, the seller is obligated to update it. Notice that it does say, or make reasonable repairs prior to closing. Here we go again with reasonable, such a subjective word. What's reasonable to you is different from what's reasonable to me. My advice is to have the seller update the CDS. The buyer understands that the CDS does not replace inspections. The buyer understands and agrees the CDS contains only statements made by the seller. Parties agree that brokers are not responsible nor liable for any information in the CDS, and the brokers have met requirements of the South Carolina Code 27-50.70. CDS is not a substitute for the buyers and inspectors inspecting the property, property issues, and off-site conditions for all needs. Hopefully, for the most part, you buyer, buyers will always have a CDS that they can refer to. Occasionally, the second paragraph is going to be checked. And the second paragraph says, buyer and seller agree that the seller will not complete, not provide a CDS to buyer in accordance with the code as amended. Buyers have sole responsibility to inspect property for all their needs. When you see an offer or contract that has this box checked, beware. Sometimes you'll see a listing that has been a rental property and turned into for sale and you get a contract on it, and there will not be a CDS, the buyer, a seller, will say that they never lived in it, so they don't know anything about it. That's just not true. If they've had somebody managing the property, or if they've been managing it themselves, they certainly know what issues the house has had. So that should be filled out. There's an exemption form for this also. This is what the property disclosure form looks like. And I bring it on here so when you see it, look down to the very bottom of the page, you see REV 11-2019. That lets you know that is the most current copy. And just for curiosity, I'm going to flip through these pages so you can see what it looks like. You'll see that on each page, the choices the seller has is yes, no, or no representation. If you ever see one of these that every box is checked, every question is checked, no representation, it's also a red flag. You'll notice at the bottom of each page, there are places for the initials for the owner and the purchaser on each page as we go through it. Obviously, this is just going on through the pages. Then we get to the last page. This is the page for the signatures where the owner signed and then the buyer signs it, saying they have gotten it, received it. 
and they are aware of the situation. Then the very last uh, is the HOA Homeowners Association addendum. If there's an HOA, this must be completed by the seller. Now we look at the exemption form. There are certain situations where the owner does not is not required by law to complete this disclosure form. Unfortunately, it gets abused all the time. And one of the exemptions is if both parties agree not to receive one. And therefore, in your contract, there's a choice. If that not going to attach a property disclosure box is checked and the buyer signs a contract, then they are agreeing to not receive a property disclosure. You can receive a copy of this by going to the South Carolina LLR site, Real Estate Commission site, or you can email me and I'll be glad to email it to you. Liz, L-I-Z, at agentownedrealty.com. Going with the contract to number 17, lead-based paint lead hazards. If the property was built or contains items created prior to 1978, it may contain lead-based hazards and parties agree to sign a disclosure of information of lead-based paint and our lead hazards form. It's SER 315 and give copies to the brokers. Parties acknowledge receiving and understanding the EPA pamphlet, Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. For their protection, buyers shall conduct, obtain inspections of all property issues per their needs. This lead-based paint requirement is not a state form or state requirement. It is a federal requirement. So any house built before 1978, you have to have this lead-based paint form addendum filled out and completed. And that's another course really in itself is how to complete that form. It is misused and misfilled out a lot. You need to pay attention to all the blanks and spots on the form. Also, this paragraph is stating the parties acknowledge receiving and understanding the EPA pamphlet, Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. There's a pamphlet that describes all of that. And when they sign this contract, they're acknowledging that they've received a copy of that if the house was built before 1978. So make sure you have access. I know Zip Forms has that in Zip Forms, so you can always print it out and send it to folks. Moving on down to 18, sex offender slash criminal information. Parties agree that brokers are not responsible for obtaining or disclosing information in the South Carolina Sex Offender Registry, and no course of action may be brought against any brokers for failure to obtain a disclosed sex offender or criminal information. Buyer and seller agree that they have sole responsibility to obtain their own sex offender, death, psychological stigma, clandestine laboratory, and crime information from sources, that is law enforcement or the web. The buyer may obtain information about the sex offender registry and persons registered with the registry by contacting the local sheriff or other appropriate law enforcement officials. Let's talk about this for a minute. So many agents feel like they need to check the sex registry online to see if there are any sex offenders in the neighborhood when they're showing property. Do not do that. If the buyer is concerned about that, advise them to call the sheriff's office and they can the sheriff's office can tell them where to go to look for stuff like that. It is not your responsibility as an agent to do that. As a matter of fact, it's a risk if you start doing that. For one thing, how do you know it's that's true information? And the last thing you want to do is accuse someone of doing something they did not do. Next, we're going to look at 19, the trust account. This is what we talk about, whether we can have the earnest money in interest-bearing accounts or not, and what happens to it. Trust account interest charitable contribution. According to the South Carolina Real Estate Commission, regulations, and South Carolina laws, any interest earned from deposits to closings on buyer's earnest money deposit belongs to the buyer. It is understood that the broker may or may not place deposited earnest monies into an interest-bearing account. So they would choose whether it may or may not. Some brokers have interest-bearing accounts, some do not. So if that's something you want to check with your broker about. If buyer's earnest money deposit is deposited, into an interest-bearing account, the parties agree that the broker will retain all interest earned in said account and may contribute some or all to charitable enterprise. So by signing this contract, 
and check in the box, may deposit earnest monies into interest-bearing account. The buyer is giving the broker permission to have an interest-bearing account and for the broker to retain all the interest on that account. Your job in respect to this contract is that you know what the paragraphs say, you know what this says, and you make sure your buyer understands what it says. Number 20. The South Carolina Income Tax on Non-Resident Gain and Compliance and USA Federal Income Tax. Seller and buyer will comply with the provisions of South Carolina laws regarding state income tax withholding requirements. If the seller is not a resident or has not filed South Carolina state income tax returns, seller and buyer will comply with the United States of America federal income tax laws. Seller and buyer shall discuss tax laws and minimization actions with their qualified tax advisor. Parties will comply with all local, state, federal laws and any rules. So what is the South Carolina income tax on non-resident gain? In South Carolina, it is 7% of the net on the closing disclosure form to the seller, non-resident. If the person is a non-resident of South Carolina when the house closes, they either have to sign a form uh, that the attorneys have stating that they will file a South Carolina income tax return the next year, or they will have 7% withheld at closing of the net, not of the sales price, but of the net. And non-resident corporations is 5% is withheld. What's interesting about this to me is that this really is a responsibility of the buyer. You're saying, what? But it's a seller that's moving out of state, yes, and the, sell the state will not be able to get hold of the seller because they're gone. So the person who's now in the house would be responsible for this. So you want to make sure that you're aware of this, your buyers are aware of this, and at the closing table, if you know that seller's going to be out of town, out of state, make sure that the attorney knows that, and they will take care of that situation at the closing. Let's move on to 21, the entire and binding agreement. It's also known as a merger clause. Parties agree that this contract expresses the entire agreement between the parties, that there is no other agreement, oral or otherwise, modifying the terms, and this contract is binding on parties and principals, heirs, personal representatives, successors, and assigns. Illegal provisions are separable. What this is really saying is that this is the only agreement between the buyer and seller. There are no other agreements, either written or oral. And another thing I'd point out here is when it says it's binding on all parties and principals, heirs, personal representatives, successors, and assigns, and a long time ago, I thought that assigns meant that the contract could be assigned. But I was told by attorneys that that is not what it means here. It simply means if the seller, if somebody dies and it gets assigned. If you have a buyer that wants to be able to assign their contract, then that needs to be put on the front where you put the buyer's name. You put the buyer's name and or assigns on that line. That's how you handle that. Now moving on to 22, adjustments. This is an interesting paragraph and there's a good bit to it. It says buyer and seller agree to settle or prorate annually or as appropriate as of closing date. A. Utilities and waste fees issued after closing, which includes service for the time property was owner occupied by the seller. B. Real estate taxes and owner association C. Fees assessments for the calendar year of the closing. C. Any rents, deposits, fees associated with leasing. D. Insurance, EMS service, fuel slash consumables, and assessments, period. What this is showing you is the different things that are going to be prorated at closing. Things that the seller would be responsible for for the time they occupied or owned the property. The closing attorney shall make tax prorations based on the available tax information deemed reliable by the closing attorney. They do their best job to get the correct information, but it is not always correct. Should the tax or test tax estimate or proration later become inaccurate or change, the buyer and seller shall make any financial adjustments between themselves once accurate tax information is available, and buyer takes timely, reasonable steps to minimize taxes. This section survives closing. A good example of this is we had a closing it closed about the second week in December, it was Dorchester County, and so the taxes were prorated. The seller was paying a 6% rate, 
and the buyer was qualified for a 4% rate. And they got the 4% rate by applying for it. Well, then about March or April, this new owner received a check from Dorchester County for over $3,000 for a refund of, uh, from taxes from the previous year. Who does that money belong to? Does it belong to the buyer? Belong to the seller? doesn't really belong to the buyer because they only lived in the house two weeks. The seller paid all that money, but is he really entitled to it? Not really, because he was supposed to pay 6%. So the buyer and seller, according to the contract, the buyer and seller were supposed to get together and work it out. I don't know if she contacted the seller or not, but that is what the contract is telling them to do. Going back to the paragraph here, buyer is solely responsible for timely and reasonably minimizing the buyer's taxes and obtaining tax minimization procedural information, including related legal counsel and financial counsel, saying the buyer is totally responsible for making the application for the 4% assessment. It will be discussed. Most of the attorneys will discuss this at closing and tell them all about it and how to go about applying for it, but the buyer has to apply for it. I make, just make sure you know to advise the buyers on this. The last line, I've got it highlighted. Special assessments approved prior to closing shall be the responsibility of the seller. Special assessments approved after closing shall be the responsibility of the buyer. If you're selling condos, especially in the Charleston Tri-County market, almost every condo association that I'm aware of in this market has assessments, special assessments. If you're selling one of those, you need to make sure you know what the assessments are. And also talk with the HOA to see if they have any assessments that they anticipate coming down the road. Subdivisions have HOAs also, and sometimes there's special assessments associated with those. I'll tell you, we had a situation where we had a listing, and of course our agent had given the seller the estimated proceeds. The night before closing, the board for the HOA had a meeting, and they approved a special assessment of roughly $15,000, $16,000. And the closing was the next day. So the seller had to pay that assessment. The seller was not happy. But what if the board had not met until the night after the closing? Then the buyer would have had that. This is scary. So you've got to make sure as an agent that you have checked into this and you know what's happening in the area that you're selling. You just need to make sure that if you're selling a condo to a buyer, that they, if, even if there are no assessments presently there, you need to advise the buyer that this is something that certainly could happen and that they would be responsible for it if it does. Paragraph 23, default slash breach of contract. If the seller defaults in the performance of any of the seller's obligation under this contract, the buyer may deliver notice of default to the seller and terminate the contract or pursue any remedies available to buyer at law or equity and recover attorney's fees and all other direct costs of litigation if the seller found in default or breach of contract. It goes on to say if the buyer defaults on the performance of any of the buyer's obligation, the seller may do the same things it listed for the buyer. And C, if either or both parties default, parties agree to sign an escrow deposit disbursement agreement or release agreement. And then D, Parties may agree in writing to allow a cure period for default. If with the cure period, either party cures the default and delivers notice, parties shall proceed under the contract. The issue comes here when someone feels that the other party is in default of the contract. Sometimes it's not real clear, and uh, really it's what an attorney uh, judge would say. So a judge pretty much will have to determine if the party is actually in default of the contract. So just because one party thinks the other party is in default, they can't just deliver notice and terminate the contract. Because who's to say? It could go to court and the judge might say, wait, that person is not in default. So this paragraph is just a little odd to me. But it does spell out what is supposed to happen if one of the parties is in default. 24. Mediation. To potentially avoid expensive lengthy, uncertain litigation, parties may voluntarily, cooperatively decide which mediator to hire 
how to pay the mediator, where to meet for mediation talks, and the own settlement agreement. Mediators do not decide settlement outcomes. Mediation is the National Association of Realtors' preference for settling disputes, and therefore it is in this paragraph. The parties decide the outcome in mediation. Mediators fairly facilitate, merely facilitate the parties, reaching their own settlement and documenting the settlement. Parties agree to attempt mediation for any dispute, claim, breach, representations made by any party slash broker or other, that is concealment, misrepresentation, negligence, fraud, or service issues related to this contract by using the National Association of Realtors Mediation Dispute System. And it's spelled out there with a link to it. So by signing this contract, your buyer and sellers are agreeing that if there's a dispute, they will first go to mediation before going to the courts. Parties agree that the duty to attempt mediation survives closing and any signed mediation settlement agreement is binding. Parties agree some matters may proceed without mediation. It's foreclosure, action to enforce a mortgage or deed of trust, a rent-to-own agreement, unlawful detainer action, smile enforce, file enforce mechanics lien, probate issues, and a plea to action on earnest money. Parties agree that some matters are not a waiver of mediation nor a breach of duty to attempt mediation, such as filing judicial action, enabling recording notice of pending action, order for attachment, receivership, injunction, or other provisional remedies. One, see you, one thing you will see is if you're dealing with a third-party relocation company, quite often they X out this whole paragraph. And if a buyer wants to buy that house that's owned by a relocation company, they have to agree to it. Also note that it says one of the things that exempt from this paragraph is interpleader action on earnest money. So what is interpleader action on earnest money? If buyers and sellers cannot agree as to who is supposed to get the earnest money, then the small claims court makes that decision. And so it's saying that we can take people to small claims court for interpleader action without going to mediation first. Number 25, non-reliance clause. This is not a merger clause, nor an extension of a merger clause. Parties execute this contract freely and voluntarily without reliance upon any statements, representations, inducements, promises, agreements by brokers or parties except as expressly stipulated or set forth in this contract. If not contained herein, such statements, representations, inducements, promises, or agreements shall be of no force or effect. Parties acknowledge that brokers are being retained solely as licensed real estate agents and not as an attorney, tax slash financial advisor, appraiser, surveyor, engineer, mold or air quality expert, home inspector, or other professional service providers. I think you can see why this is important in this contract and why you need to explain the paragraph to your buyers. You let them know, it's specifically telling them that you're simply a real estate agent. You're not an appraiser. You're not a tax advisor. You're not a home inspector. You're simply a real estate agent, and that's all they've hired you for. What scares me and alarms me is when I hear agents telling someone, oh, that's a really good deal. I've checked the comps in the area. That's a really good deal. Or this house is perfect. There's nothing wrong with this house. You don't know those things, so don't tell those things. Emphasize to your buyer that, again, we are not all those different qualified people. We are a real estate agent. 26. Broker disclaimer. This is a very important contract uh, paragraph also. You need to make sure and explain this to your buyers. Broker disclaimer. Parties acknowledge that brokers give no warranties or representations of any kind, expressed or implied, as to the condition of the property, including but not limited to termites, radon, mold, asbestos, moisture, environmental issues, water waste, air quality, HVAC, utilities, plumbing, electrical, or structure, etc. Giving no representation of the condition of the property, the survey, or legal matters, square footage. No representation of off-site conditions, schools, title, including but not limited to easements, encroachments, projections, encumbrances, restrictions, covenants, setbacks, and the like. 
I've given a representation of fitness for a particular purpose of the property of improvements. No representations about zoning ordinance and restrictions. Projected income, value, marketability, taxes, insurance, other possible benefits to the buyer. It's just really itemizing a lot of things and it's making sure the buyer is aware that again, we are simply real estate agents. We're not going to give them any information about any of these things that they can depend on. We just don't do that. The last line, parties consent that their brokers may communicate with them via any means and use or disclose information not made confidential by written instructions of the parties. I can't emphasize enough that you go over this with your buyers. This is a second paragraph. This is address the fact that we're real estate agents. We're not appraisers. We're not tax folks. We're not attorneys. We're real estate agents. 27. Brokers' Compensation. Parties direct closing attorney to use settlement funds to collect and disperse brokers' compensation to brokers in accordance with agreements and document compensation on the settlement statement. If a party disputes a broker's compensation, that party agrees to retain a South Carolina law firm to escrow only the disputed amount of broker's compensation until the dispute is resolved by a written agreement signed by that party and the affected broker, arbitration award, or court order. Party requesting the escrow shall pay all costs for the escrow. If the dispute is not resolved within 180 calendar days of closing, the escrow shall be dispersed to the broker. Parties agree that brokers are third-party beneficiaries to this contract and have standing to seek remedies at law and equity. Parties represent that their only enforceable agency agreements are with the brokers disclosed in this contract. Again, here they're saying that the, only the brokers that are represented on page one are the only ones involved with this contract. There are no other enforcement agreements with anybody else. Parties consent to brokers possibly receiving compensation from the home warranty company and or others if compensation is paid by in accordance with laws and realtor ethics. So it's saying here that it's okay the parties acknowledging that the brokers may receive compensation from selling a home warranty or others. Now we're heading into number 28. I call it the catch-all section of the contract. Attachments, other contingencies, terms, and or stipulations. There may be attachments to this contract. The most recent changes, amendments, attachments, contingencies, stipulations, addendum, additions, exhibits, or writings agreed to by the parties is evidence of the party's intent and agreement and shall control any contract language conflicts. Parties shall initial and date contract changes if any documents are attached as addenda, amendments, attachments, or exhibits considered part of this agreement, such documents can be further identified or described here. And this is where you have lines to write down things that are attached to the contract. I have put in green on here the, the words for the numbers. The actual contract only has the numbers, like SCR 390. I just was helping you out here by putting what they were, like the general addendum for 390. I don't know about y'all, but it's really hard for me to keep up with all the numbers. Like, what is a SCR 320? What is a 393? I have to look them up, pretty much all of them. So I'm just putting the names here. Again, anything that you're going to attach to this contract, if there's a bill of sale, if there's an addendum, the wire fraud addendum, I personally think the wire fraud addendum should always be here and should always attach it to the contract because both buyers and sellers need to be very aware of this, and having them sign it with the contract is a great idea. The intent of this paragraph is not for you to write your own contingency on the sale of a property or your own due diligence verbiage. That is the unauthorized practice of law, and that is a very dangerous thing to do. Use the due diligence section of the contract. Use the SCR 504 for the contingency. The State Association has state forms for about everything there is. So use the forms. 29. Notice and delivery. Notice is any unilateral communication. Offers, counteroffers, acceptance, termination, unilateral requests for better terms, and associated addenda amendments from one party to the other. So it's saying unilateral is any notice from one party to the other. Unilateral means only one person has to sign. Notice to or from a broker representing a party is deemed notice to or from the party.
Notice to or from a broker representing a party is deemed notice to or from the party. So if you have a buyer as a client, then there are your, you're representing them. And any notice given to you is considered like being given to them. Of course, not true if you're not representing them. And if the person is a, cu a customer, then you're not representing a customer. It goes on to say, all notice, consents, approvals, counterparts, and similar actions required under contract must be in paper or electronic writing and will only be effective as of delivery to the notice address, email, fax, written below, and awareness of receipt by the broker, unless parties agree otherwise in writing. This is very important because it's saying here there'll be any notices, consents, counterparts, anything like this under the contract must be in paper or electronic writing and will only be effective as of delivery to the notice address written below. There's an address for the notice for the buyer and for the seller. And we'll get there in a minute. This reminds me to remind you that all contracts must be in writing. Verbal contracts mean nothing, absolutely nothing. Verbal contracts are nothing. And this paragraph is saying that the signature is on this contract and the contract will be binding only if delivered to the notice address below and the awareness of receipt by the broker. 30. Acknowledgements. Due to potential criminal activity, Parties are solely responsible to verify all wire instructions with a law firm slash bank and understand that audio-visual surveillance may occur. We're giving everybody notice that there may be surveillance equipment in the house while they're looking at the house. Also, it says that parties are solely responsible to verify all wiring instructions. In today's world, we have to be so careful with the wiring instructions. That's the wire fraud addendum that we have. So using that wire fraud addendum, we are notifying the buyers in two different places about the potential of wire fraud. Parties are also advised and understand that audiovisual surveillance may occur in the property and parties should plan accordingly and comply with all federal, state, and local laws. Parties acknowledge receiving, reading, reviewing, and understanding this contract, the South Carolina Disclosure of Real Estate Brokerage Relationships Form, any agency agreements, and copies of these documents. So the buyers acknowledge that they have received, read, reviewed, and they understand the contract, the South Carolina Disclosure of Agency Relationships, any agency agreement, and that they're getting copies of all these documents. Parties acknowledge they've had time and opportunity to review all documents and public records and receive legal counsel from their attorneys prior to signing this contract. Emphasize to them they are signing, saying that they have time an opportunity to review all documents, public records, and also to get legal help. 31. Expiration of offer. When signed by a party and intended as an offer or counteroffer, this document represents an offer to the other party that may be rescinded any time prior to, and you put a date and time, unless accepted or counteroffered by the other party in written form delivered prior to such deadline. You need to put a deadline in here. So for some people who don't put deadlines, the South Carolina Association has added a line here. This offer will expire automatically if no actions are taken by either party 30 calendar days after the offer is submitted. So people are always asking me, how long should I give someone to respond? Well, that depends on a lot of things. You have to use a little common sense. But if somebody's in town, the seller's in town, I don't personally like to give them two or three days because then they can shop your contract. I like to give them maybe 24 hours at the most to respond. Notice another part of this. It says, unless the counter offer offered by the other party in written form. Uh, so many agents are guilty of countering back and forth verbally. You have to remember verbal contracts mean nothing. They are no good. You cannot depend on them. You should never tell your buyer what was verbally communicated to you unless you emphasize that it was verbal, which means nothing. We had a situation where our, we had an agent that had a buyer from out of town. They had put in an offer on a property, was not the full price, and they were countering back and forth verbally. The buyer left and went out of town. The listing agent tells my buyer agent that the seller has accepted it. We've got a deal, were his words. So my buyer agent called the buyer, who's out of town, 
and says, we have a deal. Guess what? Later that night, the listing agent got another offer, which was better than what our buyer had submitted, and the seller accepted it and signed it. There was nothing that we could do about that because verbal offers are not legal in South Carolina. That was a lawsuit that was not a fun time. One has to remember, not everybody stays by their word. It must be in writing. Don't get caught in this situation. There used to be a line on the contracts we used to use for an expiration of a counter. That line is gone. And then we come to in witness whereof. This contract has been duly executed by the parties as true to the best of their knowledge and belief. If the signee is not a party, appropriate legal documents, that is a power of attorney, a corporate authorization, either are attached or to be delivered within so many blank calendar days. And then a statement party should initial and date all page and changes in the contract. What we're talking about here is if you have um, a corporation, an LLC, a, um, a state, a trust, it's a buyer or the seller, there needs to be someone, an individual person, who signs the contract. You can never put ABC Corporation as a signature. It needs to be an individual person. And it also needs to be the right person. That's what this section is for. If the signee is not a party, so it's someone that can sign for an LLC or corporation, then we need to have some paperwork that proves that they have that authority to sign for that particular corporation or LLC or trust. Now we're moving into the critical part here is getting the signatures on the contract. Of course, I think it goes without saying that the signature should match the name on the front of the contract. Believe it or not, I have seen situations where it didn't match, but it should match. And then we have the notice address. We have the notice address, which is email or fax. Uh, text cannot be considered here as email address. It can be the official legal or mailing address, email or fax. If you are representing the buyer or the seller, if they are your client and you are representing them, I recommend that you put your contact information here for that address. Because if you so they contact you, then that's considered contacting the client. And a lot of the agents just don't want the other agent having their client's contact information. This works to do it this way. If they are a customer, you must put their contact information down because a customer is completely different from being a client. You're not representing that customer. Therefore, the delivery has to be to the customer directly. Now we go to page 9. This is the only thing on page 9, but it's still a very important part of the contract. I know that you can all read, but um, the top section is for the buyer, the buyer's agent slash the company, then your buyer's agent license number, that's your LLR, your LLR license number, and the LLR office code number. If you do not know your LLR office code, it is on your license. Your license number and the office code number are both on the license itself. It should be on your pocket card. You can find it there, or you can go to LLR website and find it there. The next section is for the seller, the same information. Seller agent slash company, the seller's agent license number and the office code number, the email address and the telephone number. These things are important. For one thing, you want to make sure that the other agent's license has not expired, that they're legitimate. So it's important for you to be able to check that or anybody to be able to check it. So make sure you get this filled out correctly. And at the bottom, there's a paragraph that's basically saying, or is saying, that this form is copyright of the South Carolina Association of Realtors. That completes the contract itself. Next, there's a 25 to 30 minute discussion with me, the instructor, Mama Liz. The purpose of this is that we can interact. You can ask me questions. You can ask me for examples of different sections of the contract. Hopefully you wrote down notes as you were going through the course and you do have some questions or some things you'd like to talk to me about. If you want the credit for the CE class, you have to call. I have to talk to you. If you're not looking for credit for the CE course, you are through with this course. I'm going to move into the final instructions to get you registered and also for the quiz. The final instructions 
you will need to email me to obtain your registration form. And once I receive the registration form, you will be sent a link to the quiz, which you must pass to receive your certificate. The quiz is expected to take you roughly an hour. Once you pass the quiz, you will be emailed your certificate of completion. The registration form will be sent via DocuSign. And my email address is liz at agentownedrealty.com. I always like to end my classes, my courses, with my favorite saying, nothing is a problem until it's a problem. Just think about that. What is it saying? We need to learn the right things to do and do the right things. Learn how to write a good contract. Write a good contract. Do not do things intentionally that you know are wrong. Nothing's a problem until it's a problem.